chapter three is looking at cost classification and behavior, an important topic in management accounting, as we need to be able to identify and explain what's going to happen to costs at different levels of output so that we can make future predictions. Cost behavior then is helping us to identify the different types of costs that can occur. So we've got different sorts of costs that we're going to be looking at and the ultimate aim then of splitting out costs according to their behavior is trying to predict what's going to happen to the total costs at a given level of output. So some of the costs then will remain constant, these are the fixed costs, and some of them will vary. And we're going to introduce the very important technique in management accounting, which is the high-low method. Under cost classification, we'll be thinking about different ways that we can carve up the pie or carve up the total costs of the business. So we'll be thinking about the different items we need to group costs together for, whether that's cost objects, units, or whether it's a part of the business, so a cost center. We'll be looking at how we can group our costs together according to the function of the departments. The first important split will be whether there are production costs, i.e. the costs that exist because we have a factory, and non-production costs, the costs that exist because we have a business. Under both of those headings, there'll be a further breakdown according to the nature of the costs. So the materials, the labor and overhead can be broken down and we'll be thinking about whether overheads are directly attributable or whether those are indirect costs incurred during production. With cost classification, what we're trying to do is to arrange our costs into different groups. And there are lots of different ways that we can split these costs up. So we could do it by a function or department of the organization, or alternatively, we could do it by nature, so the type of cost that's been incurred. Regardless of the method of classification, what we're trying to do is to end up working out how much it costs us to produce one unit of the good or service. And that's so we can go on to work out inventory valuations um, and also to work out pricing and production decisions. So what we're going to do then is to work through different types of classification. So we could then split it by function. And the first thing um, in splitting costs by function is whether or not our costs relate to production or whether they're non-production. So when we're thinking about production costs then, these are the costs that exist because we have a factory. And these will be all of the costs then that are incurred as that factory is run. So that could be supply of raw materials all the way through the production process. And in a moment, we'll break those production costs down further. All of the other costs then are the costs that exist because we have a business. So these will be the sorts of costs in running the head office, in the administrative and financial functions of the business. So if we break our production costs down, there are three ways that we can classify them according to their nature or their type of cost. So in our factory, then we will have production costs which relate to materials. So the things that are actually used to make the product. We'll also have labor costs of the workforce who are manufacturing the product. But we'll also have overheads then which support the production process and which enable the factory to run smoothly. And in lecture example one, we're just going to think of some examples then of different types of production costs. So for materials, then we could have things like the raw materials for production. So there could be things like plastic or wood, depending on what we're making. We might also have oil um, and grease for the machines. If we're thinking then about production labor costs, we might have um, supervisors, workers, uh, people who are actually involved in making the production. We might also have 
people that are involved then in keeping the factory clean and tidy. Overheads then are going to be costs then which are in support of the production process. So that could be the factory rent, um, it could be insurance for the machines, um, electricity, um, all of the costs then associated with the factory. We can also break down our non-production costs further. So the administrative costs then are all of the costs which are actually involved in managing the organisation. And we'll think about some examples in lecture example two. Selling costs then are everything that helps us to um, advertise our goods to customers and retain those customers. Distribution then is all about dispatching them and delivering the goods to the customers. And the finance department then, the financing costs are all of the costs incurred to finance the business. So let's have a look at some examples now. Examples then of administrative non-production costs could be things like depreciation of the office equipment, salaries for people including the directors, who are involved in the day-to-day -day running of the business. For sales costs then for selling we might have salaries then of the sales staff. We might need cars for the um, sales reps so that they can get around the country and there might also be costs of advertising the products and promotion. The distribution then we need to think about how we're going to get the goods to the customers. So we might need uh, packing costs. We might need salaries then for the drivers. And the costs associated with the van. So for example, things like insurance um, and tax. For finance costs then we'll be thinking about salaries of people who work in the finance department, so the FD and the account staff. And we might also need specialist finance software um, or equipment which needs to be depreciated. In example three then we've been asked to identify and group the costs involved in the production of a CD. So these are all of the factory costs then, the cost that exists because we actually have a factory making CDs. And we're thinking about the direct costs and the indirect non-manufacturing costs that are actually associated with the production. So if we're thinking about our direct costs then, we can split those into materials, labor and overheads. So direct materials then will be the blank CD itself and the box that the CD goes into with the with the artist's details on. We'd also have factory staff who are directly involved in producing those CDs and burning the music to the CD. And then as an, a direct um, cost that is attributable to every single product, we're going to have the royalties. So the royalties that have to be paid to the artist. If we're thinking about the indirect materials, that will be things like oil and grease for the machines, which can't be attributed to a particular product. We'll have the supervisor who isn't actually producing any products, but is going to be um, overseeing all of the production and wouldn't be there if we didn't have the factory. And then the biggest category of indirect costs will be all of the rent and rates insurance, depreciation and other expenses that exist because we have that factory. So of our expenses then, uh, most of those will be indirect and actually the only one that we can think of here that's going to be direct is going to be the royalty because we're going to pay that every time um, a CD is made. And you can see that the CD cost card then is broken down. So all of our direct production costs, so the 
the blank CD, the factory staff and the royalties are going to come into the direct production costs, the total of which is equal to the prime cost. And then we're going to add on to that all of the indirect production costs, so the supervisor, the oil, the rent rates, etc. And that's going to give us our total production costs. Then we'll add on to that non-production costs, so administration, perhaps any selling and distribution costs. And ultimately, that cost card can then give us the total product cost. As well as understanding the nature of costs, business also need to understand how their costs will behave as production volumes increase or decrease. And the reason for that is so that you can try and predict the costs in the future for when you're doing your budgets and need to know what resources you're going to need available. So the idea will be then that the more you make, the higher the costs will be. There will be an increase in costs as production increases. But it might not be that there's an exact relationship depending on the nature of the costs. So what we're going to do here then is classify the costs according to how they behave as output changes. And we're going to have a look at different diagrams which represent these changes. So fixed costs, first of all, then, is one which does not get affected by changes in the volume of output. So we're thinking about something then which is constant regardless of the number of units produced. Diagrammatically, if we've got the number of units on the x-axis, that would be shown by a horizontal line because it's unaffected by the number of units that are produced. So examples then of a fixed cost in a factory would be the rent, rates and insurance costs. We don't have to pay more rent to the landlord if we're going to produce more units. So it's a fixed cost and it's fairly easy to predict what that cost is going to be because it's the same regardless of the number of units produced. In reality though, most costs are only going to be fixed within a certain level of activity. And so the next one that we need to consider is a stepped fixed cost. What we have here then is a fixed cost that is fixed for a given level of output, but then to make one extra unit, we're going to have a jump up. So we would represent this then like a set of stairs um, with a jump up each time the cost increases. So that could be um, if we need to rent additional production space as we increase um, our production volumes, or it could be a supervisor. So if we need um, an additional supervisor as more units are produced. So one supervisor may be able to supervise the production of X number of units, but once we've reached that point, we're going to need to employ another supervisor. Some costs then will change every time a unit is produced, and they're what we call variable costs. So they are directly related to the number of units that are being produced. And the variable cost per unit is deemed to be constant we're going to end up with a graph that goes through the origin. And as you can see, the more units you produce, the more costs will rise. Examples then of a variable cost will be raw materials. So if we go back to your study text example, for every study text that we produce, we need to spend a certain amount on a paper. We might also have variable labour costs. The final one that we need to consider then is a mixed cost, which is also sometimes known as a semi-variable cost. And it's mixed because it contains the both the fixed and the variable elements. So some of it's affected by a change in activity and some of it isn't. It's going to start then part way through the y-axis. And this bottom bit here then will be the fixed cost, which is the same regardless of the number of units produced. And then we've got that sloping line to represent the variable costs.
And an example here then could be your telephone bill. So the fixed cost is the line rental and the variable cost are the calls that are made on top of that. It would also work in a manufacturing environment for labour where they're paid a fixed amount as a guaranteed wage but then perhaps paid a piece rate for every unit that is actually produced. In reality the total costs of the business then are likely to be represented by a mixed cost so have fixed elements and variable elements. So we've got the total cost line here on the graph and as you can see that's very similar to the mixed cost because it's made up then of a fixed cost element which is the same regardless of the number of units produced and then we've also got that sloping line representing the constant variable cost per unit. And the equation then of that line is that the total cost is equal to the fixed cost plus the variable cost per unit times by the number of units being produced. And sometimes you'll see that represented as y equals a plus bx. y then is the dependent variable. So in what we've been talking about, it's the total cost. And it's the dependent variable because it's dependent on the number of units being produced. So x then is the independent variable and that's what's driving y. So here we're talking about output as our independent variable. A then is the fixed cost. It's the intercept on the y-axis. It's the point at which it crosses the y-axis. And B then is the gradient or the slope of the line for the variable costs. So y equals a plus bx. And that's a very important equation throughout your ACCA studies. So if we think about your y equals a plus bx, a then is this point here on the y-axis and b then is going to be the slope of that line. And what you can do is you can look at the costs at any number, the, the output level, and you can read off what the costs would be expected to be at that level of output meaning that it can be used for cost predictions. And what we're going to understand now is a method then for splitting out the fixed elements and the variable elements so that we can use it for cost prediction. Here then in example five, we have to choose the graph which is going to show the costs of raw materials for a particular period. And this is given the fact that the purchase price of one unit of raw material is constant to a certain level of activity. After that point though, the cost per unit falls and that applies both to further units purchased but also to units that have already been purchased. So what we need to do then is look for which graph is going to show that. So we know then that the raw materials is a variable cost and that means that it must start from the origin. So therefore it can't be graph B because when we purchase zero units the cost isn't zero. We're now left with a choice between A, C and D. If we look at graph C um, we can see then that the cost per unit falls but it doesn't apply retrospectively to the previous units purchased so there's no fall in the total costs so it can't be graph C it now has to be between graph A and graph D on first glance then there's very little difference between A and D in both of these graphs the cost per unit is definitely falling because the total cost falls when the discount has been reached. The subtle difference though is that the cost for raw materials must be zero when no units are purchased. So for that to be the case this second line has to go back through the origin. So therefore the correct answer here is D. Having considered the behaviour of the cost, we need to think about how we're going to collect that 
information so that we can use it for costing products. And what we're going to do is we're going to think about different ways then that we can collect that and different levels that we can collect it. So a cost object then is something which we want to collect cost data for. So that could be a particular product or a production line or a job or a customer or a department and division of the company. So that could be something that we're producing that we want to know the, the costs of. A cost unit then is one particular unit of product or service within the organisation. So a cost unit then could come out of a production line or a job. Whether a cost unit relates to one actual unit will depend upon the type of business. So for a company manufacturing something like a car, then it would be absolutely appropriate to have the cost unit as one item, one car. But if we're making something like ball bearings, which have a very small cost and are always going to be produced and sold in, in batches, then it would be appropriate to cost them per batch because we're never going to sell just one ball bearing to a customer. With a builder then, we might be looking at just having the cost of a job or a contract. So every single item is going to be different. And we'll be looking at some of the characteristics of job costing later on in the course. And again, for something like a management consultancy firm, then we might be looking at a cost as being an individual project. A cost center then, so some more terminology, is a location, function, item of equipment placed in the business in which we want to collect all of our costs together. So a cost center then is basically a costing place or a costing pot for collecting the costs. And what we can do then is analyze those further. There are no strict rules then about what a cost center should be. And the definition then is going to be depending on what the business thinks is appropriate. When we're thinking about um, cost centers then, we're going to be usually thinking about manufacturing costs. And in F2, that is very much the focus of our classification. What we need to think about though, when we're thinking about our cost centers within our factory, is think about whether they're production cost centers, whereby the units that we're producing will actually flow through, or whether they're service centres which exist because we have the factory, which exists to support the main production centres. So in example six, then we're going to be coming up with examples then of the different types of cost centres. So production cost centres and service cost centres. And if we're thinking about manufacturing clothes, the production cost centers are going to be where the clothes are actually produced. So it might be that they need to be machined. They might be finished off in some way, neatened off. They might be ironed or pressed. They could be packed, ready for um, into cellophane or on hangers or into boxes. And in each of those items, the item of clothing that we're producing is going to actually pass through all of those departments. So when the machine is cutting it out and sewing it, um, pressing it and then packing it. The service cost centers then, the t-shirts or whatever other item we're making, are not actually going to pass through these, but we wouldn't have them if we didn't have a business that was producing these products. So we might have a canteen for our factory workers to eat in, we might have the stores department where we're going to be keeping the cotton. And we might have a maintenance department whereby the maintenance staff are going to be maintaining those machines in the different production centers. Now, obviously, the production cost centers will vary enormously depending on the type of product being produced. But the service cost centers that you've got here, canteen, stores and maintenance, are some of the more common ones. When we've started to analyze our costs out into their fixed and variable elements, then 
what we can think about is trying to estimate what our total costs are going to be. And the method we're going to use to do that is called the high-low method. And what it does then is it estimates what amount of cost is fixed and what amount is variable. And we're going to do this through a four-step method. In worked example one then, we're going to work through the four steps of the high-low method. And we start off then by being given the total costs for a business at five different levels of output. And what we need to do then is come up with the total cost equation. So y equals a plus bx. So step one then is to review the cost records from the previous period and work out what the highest and the lowest level of output is and their associated costs. So you can see here then that when 200,000 units, when 200 units were produced, the costs were $30,000. And when 1,000 units were produced, the costs were 110,000. And we summarize that in a little table here. In step two, then, we're going to work out what the change in cost is as a result of producing those extra units. So we can see then that an extra $80,000 was incurred to produce 800 extra units. And the assumption is here then that fixed costs are constant and the variable cost per unit is constant. What that means then is that all of those 80,000 extra dollars must have been because we were producing extra units. So the variable cost then can be calculated in step three as using the additional costs divided by the additional number of units. So here we've got a variable cost per unit of $100. So straight away we can see that it can't be B or C because we've got a variable cost of $100. What we do need is a final step to work out what those fixed costs are. So we know then that when we made 1,000 units, the total costs were 110,000. If the variable costs were $100 per unit, the variable cost must have been $100,000. And so what that means then is that the fixed costs were 10,000. And so we end up with the equation um, 10,000 plus 100x, which gives us answer D. So once you've done the calculations, make sure that you select the right answer. So what we've effectively done then is we have plotted a line between the highest and lowest levels of output. So in this case, it was 200 units and 1,000 units. And what we've done is worked out the formula of that line. The uses for the business are that they can now use that formula to predict what future costs are going to be and use it for planning resource allocation. In example seven, we're going to use the equation for total costs that we derived in worked example one to give us a prediction of what costs will be when we make 780 units. So y then is equal to a, which is 10,000. Those fixed costs don't change regardless of the number of units we produce, plus the variable cost per unit of $100 multiplied by the number of units that we're going to be producing. So we've got 78,000 expected of variable costs and 10,000 of fixed costs. So that means our total prediction is $88,000. And you could be required to enter that number 88,000 into a box in the exam without um, having a multiple choice option. So the assumptions that we're making are that um, the variable costs per unit are constant and that we're also assuming that costs are either fixed, variable or semi-variable within a normal range.
What that means then in plain English is we're assuming then that within the range we've been given, the fixed costs are fixed and the variable costs per unit are constant. In example eight, we're asked to work out the budgeted total production cost if this factory operates at 80%. And we've been given the costs then the production costs for 100% and 65%. So what we need to do then is to use the high-low method to work out the equation for the line y equals a plus bx and then what we're going to be able to do is use that for our prediction for 80,000 units or 80% capacity. So 100% capacity then is 100,000 units and 65% capacity is 65,000 units. So the highest level of units produced then was 100,000 and the total costs for that were $378,000. The lowest level of production that we've got is 65,000 and the costs there were 290,500. So to make an extra 35,000 units, it's going to cost us an extra $87,500. So that extra cost must all have been variable costs because we were making those extra 35,000 units. So the variable cost per unit is $2.50. What we need to do now then is to work out what our fixed costs are going to do. So we can substitute that into the total cost equation. So the total cost then for 100,000 units was 378,000. The variable cost element there was 100,000 units at $2.50. That was 250,000. So therefore the fixed costs were $128,000. So my line then for the total cost prediction is the fixed costs of 128,000 plus the variable costs of 250 multiplied by the number of units. And the question asks me at 80% capacity, so that's 250 multiplied by 80,000 units, added on to those fixed costs of 128,000. Meaning my prediction for the total cost is $328,000. So this is a question then where we had to go through quite a few steps in order to get to the right answer. So it's one of those slightly more time consuming questions. An additional complication can arise as it does in lecture example nine, where we've got steps where we've got um, two elements, a stepped fixed cost this time and a variable cost, which is constant. So the step fixed cost it occurs when the number of units produced exceeds 7,000. And we've been given information about 5,000, 7,500 and 10,000 units. And what we need to do is to work out the fixed costs below and above that fix. And we also need to work out the variable costs per unit. What we're going to do here then is we're going to think about when we can apply the high-low method. Well, we know that our stepped fixed cost only comes into play when we produce more than 7,000 units. So what that means then is when we're producing 7,500 units and 10,000 units, we've got the same fixed costs. So we can use the high-low method with 7,000 as the lowest and 10,000 as the highest level of output to work out what the fixed costs are at that point and what the variable costs are. We'll then be able to apply that variable cost to the equation 
for the total costs at 5,000 units and be able to work out the fixed costs. So as you start to do more questions, you will start to spot the tricks and you know, tools that you're going to need to be able to work through to use and apply these techniques to answer different types of exam questions. So we start off then using the high-low method to work out the variable cost per unit and the fixed cost between 7,500 and 10,000 units. Ten thousand units and seven and a half thousand units. They were making an extra two and a half thousand units, and the extra costs that we're going to be incurring from seventy six and a half thousand and ninety thousand give us extra costs of thirteen and a half thousand. So the variable cost per unit. It's thirteen and a half thousand divided by two and a half thousand. That gives us a variable cost of five dollars forty per unit. At this level, the fixed costs are going to be the same as well, so we can substitute back into that equation to find the fixed costs. The total cost is 90,000 when we make 10,000 units and that's equal to the fixed cost plus 10,000 units at 540. So we've got variable costs of 54,000 so that means we've got fixed costs here of 36,000 when we're making more than 7,000 units. So we're able to answer at this point the variable cost per unit is 540 and the fixed costs above 7,000 units are 36,000. In order to work out what they're going to be below 7,000 what we need to do is we need to take that total cost equation for 5,000 units, so the 54,500, and we need to take away from that the variable costs, so 5,000 units at a variable cost of 540. So we've got 27,000 of variable costs and 54,000 of fixed costs, of total costs, sorry, that means that our fixed costs are twenty-seven and a half thousand dollars below seven thousand units. So just to clarify, then, once we make our seven thousand and first unit, there's a big jump in our fixed costs from twenty-seven and a half thousand to thirty-six thousand. But the variable cost remains the same at five forty. And that's the most complicated type of question you could expect at this level in terms of using the high-low. And we could use the same methodology if it were the other way around and the fixed costs were constant, but the variable costs altered at a certain level of output. The next thing we need to deal with then is a cost code. And this is a way then that we can classify and code a product so that we can manage our cost data. And what we're doing here then is trying to ensure that every cost can be identified by a code rather than a description. And that code will include certain things. So the nature of the cost, whether it's the material, labour or overhead. Um, the type of cost as well, whether it's direct or indirect. Which cost centre it belongs to and which department within the cost centre it's in. So we could end up with a system where we've got what we call a composite code with lots of different pieces. And here then they give an example of a composite code 413.375. And we're shown then down here what that refers to. So the first bits of the digits, the 413, um, could relate to the nature of the expenditure, which is um, subjective. So 
four is materials, a raw material, and it's plastic sheeting. So 413 is money spent on plastic sheeting. And the 375 shows that it's going as a direct cost to factory beta finishing department. And it's much less ambiguous to use that code rather than to use a description. So it's briefer and it's also more precise and it can be pulled out to allocate costs using a spreadsheet um, or some other database to a different department. So those are the advantages then of using a coding system. In this chapter then we've looked at some very important concepts for management accounting and we've tried to estimate the fixed and variable elements of a cost using that important method, the high-low method. And we're going to use then that very important line y equals a plus bx for that. We can classify our costs then according to their function or their nature so that we can work out how much it costs to produce one unit of the good or service. Production and non-production costs then is another way of splitting the functional costs and we can split those down even further according to their type. Direct costs and indirect costs then, the difference here then relates to whether or not the cost can be directly traced to one unit. So if it can be linked back to a particular unit, it's going to be a direct cost. Indirect costs are incurred because we have the factory but can't be traced to a particular unit. And what we can do with our costs then once we've split them out is to build up a cost card. We can cost then um, analyse and calculate our costs at different levels, whether that's cost centres, cost objects or cost units. We can also understand then the way in which costs behave. So we had fixed costs, stepped fixed costs and variable costs. And the combination of a fixed cost and a variable cost is known as a mixed cost. And you need to understand then how these costs change as the volume of output changes. Finally, then we looked at um, how we can code our costs to save time and reduce ambiguity.